Images are imperfect. Um, when we casually look at them, it doesn't really bother us, but when we're in the field of computer vision and we want to reason about images, we have to worry about absolutely every little thing. Now, we've already seen things like depth of focus and sensitivity leading to noise and long shutters leading to motion blur. And we need to now think about a few more things that happen because of the physical properties of a camera. And the first one is going to be so-called chromatic or color aberrations. So let me remind you, we have the same scene as before. I'm showing you a magnified view of the box here. And if you look very carefully, you will see a green and magenta fringing along the side of the box. And that's not because there's a defect in the sensor or the lens or the camera. This is interestingly a physical property of light and there is nothing we can do about it. We just have to come to live with it. So in particular, Snell's law says that light bends proportional to wavelength. So when we had this imaging uh, camera before, we had our camera, we had our lens, we had our sensor, we had our optical axis here, and we had a point out in the world and I would draw a ray here and I would bend it and it would focus and everything was good. Or I had multiple rays maybe and they would focus and everything was good. But that was denying the reality of light, which is that light is made up of a number of different wet wavelengths. And the visible part is from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And of course, there is outside the visible spectrum. All we're going to care about here is the visible spectrum. But what happens when light across the color spectrum, different wavelengths, enters this medium, a lens, glass, it will bend proportional to wavelength according to Snell's law right here, which says that n sine theta is equal to nr sine theta r. So theta is the angle that the red light is making, theta b is the angle that the blue light is making, and n is the index of reflection or refraction um, for the lens and for air. And what you see here is that the index of refraction is different for the red and the blue, which means that when light enters in, it's going to bend differently. And what that means is, for example, down here at the corner of the sensor, that point out there is going to image in the red channel and the blue channel into slightly different places. And that's not great because what we want, of course, is for the red, the green, and the blue to be fully aligned to each other and not have now just this color smearing in addition to the other um, issues around blur. And in fact, this leads to two problems. In that previous slide, I was actually just showing you one ray, but of course there are multiple rays that bend in focus as we saw earlier. And what that means is that there's two types of chromatic aberrations that are the result of Snell's law. The first one is this longitudinal, which has to do with the blur. And the second one is lateral, um, which has to do with the shift that I just showed you. So let's stay here for a second. Here, what you see is that the blue, the green, and the red are shifted relative to each other, again, because of Snell's law and the light bending differently as it enters and exits the light. Here, what you'll see is that there's also a change in the focus plane that I've done in a very exaggerated way here so you can see it. And what's happening is because the light is bending differently, its focus point is a little bit different. So that means there is a lateral shift here and there is an axial shift here, which changes the blur. So what that means is that the green channel might be focused, but the, the red and blue may not. And here you have an alignment issue. And this manifests itself in real photos, typically photos taken on very bright days. So for example, here is a photo where I've taken a highlighted part up top and I'm showing it you down below. And again, you can see that green and magenta fringing that is the result of the chromatic aberration. And there's nothing you can do about that other than recognize that it's there and try to correct for it in post-processing. Now, what's cool about these chromatic aberrations is that they're, they're actually pretty understandable. In fact, you can model them with a pretty simple distortion across the color channels. And in particular, what I'm showing you here is a vector field of the displacement of the red channel relative to the green channel. The one for blue to green is, exact, is very similar. And the, the, the length of the vectors that you see superimposed on top of this image tell you the, the, how big the distortion is in pixels. And the direction tells you how much 
of the distortion is there for the lateral chromatic aberration. That is how much have things shifted. We're not gonna address the axial here in terms of the blur. And what you notice is that near the center of the image, not quite at the center of the image, but near the center of the image, the distortion is very small. And as you move out to the periphery, the distortion gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, why is that? Well, when light goes straight through the center of the lens, it doesn't bend very much. And when it goes up at an angle and it bends more, um, then the chromatic aberrations, in particular, the lateral chromatic aberrations are more pronounced. And so if you can model these, well, then you can remove the distortion. If I can estimate the center of the distortion and the amount of distortion, well, then I can fix the various color channels. Now, the deep blurring turns out to be a little bit trickier of a problem, so we're not going to talk about it here. Um, now, you should know that in modern cameras, this isn't a huge effect, but it could be up to several pixels around the periphery. The simplest and the easiest and the safest way to do is center crop images and get rid of the periphery where you have things like significant chromatic aberrations and other types of aberrations that occur um, in a digital image. But in lieu of that, um, even these small things, depending on the measurements you want to make, could cause problems, and you should just be aware of those. Now, a second form of noise, which we've already seen, but I want to just um, quantify just a little bit more, is this kind of sort of speckle noise here, where you get these little pixel variations. These are due to a number of things. Uh, the most, the one we've already seen is the ISO, the sensitivity of the sensor. If you have a highly sensitive sensor, then it's going to generate noisy images. And the reason you would have a highly sensitive sensor is that you're in a dark room, you have a limited uh, aperture size, you have a limited shutter speed because you want things not to be blurred out in terms of motion, and, so, and you have very little light, and so you crank up the sensitivity and you get grainy images. And you can try this at home. Um, after the sun sets, go into your living room, turn down the lights, take a picture, wait until morning, take a picture, zoom in and look, and you will notice that in the daylight, the images are crisp and clear and you don't have this type of graininess. Now, there's two types of noise that get introduced in an image, and we're not actually going to talk very much about it, although they are both extremely interesting and there are huge literatures around uh, using uh, denoising images, removing noise, and using noise forensically to identify images. We're not gonna talk about the details of that, but I do wanna mention that there are two types of noise. Okay? So here on this side, I'm going to represent an image as F of XY. So F is the intensity value, XY is the horizontal, and vertical axes, uh, columns, and rows of each pixel. And let's ignore color for now. Just we'll, we'll, we'll treat this as a single uh, channel image. A great, an image here, the, I, the recorded image, the one that you actually record, can be modeled as a combination of a few things. Uh, the ideal image, G of XY, so this is if you could have a perfect image with no sensitivities, no errors, nothing, what would that look like? So that's the G right here, uh, times a fixed and unique noise signal, K of XY, I'll come back to that in a second, plus some random amount of noise. There are in fact two noise factors that contribute, a fixed and unique pattern and something that is random. The random one has to do with the quality of the sensor, how old the sensor is. Is it a hot day or a cold day? On a hot day, the sensors tend to be more noisy than on a cold day. And there's just natural fluctuations that occur um, in an image and in a sensor over its lifetime and from minute to minute, depending on environmental conditions. And so tip, most of the noise removal is focused on this type of noise, this random noise. But there is a second noise, which is very interesting, which has to do with the manufacturing process of your sensor. And this is a fixed pattern called the PRNU, the Photo Response Non-Uniformity. And what this relates to is that in that CMOS sensor, every sensor does not have exactly the same sensitivity because of just the manufacturing process and slight imperfections in the underlying medium, which means that some pixels will tend to overcount the number of photons consistently, day in and day out. And some uh, uh, cells, some pixels, will tend to undercount every day, day in and day out. And so consistently you get these small fluctuations. And you can see why, by the way, this would be useful in a forensic setting, because we can use that to ballistically identify a camera and link it to an image. We won't be talking about that here, but I want you to just know that there are these two sources of noise, 
They are largely considered undesirable, except in a forensic setting. Um, and there's a huge literature on noise removal. We will not be talking about that. Um, mainly, we won't be talking about it because modern cameras have gotten pretty good. Um, they tend to take very high resolution images, pretty high quality, and you can often deal with these random noise and even these fixed noise patterns by just downsizing the image a little bit, reducing the resolution, and that tends to filter all the noise out. But if you're interested in the noise removing literature, there's a big literature on noise removal. You can find lots and lots of papers from Wiener filters to Wavelet filters to machine learning um, on how to improve the quality of the image. But typically in computer vision, we take the images we got, we try to control the camera parameters, and we move on from there.